Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll continue now where we left off last Friday in the book Rome and Civil Liberty by James A. Wiley. Uh, James A. Wiley uh, was relating to his readers uh, the example of the Madii family, of Tuscany who were literally hauled into court for reading the Bible and teaching other Protestant works and uh, denouncing <clears throat> Roman Catholic dogmas, falsehoods such as the, the existence of purgatory and the worship of images and idols and other foolishness in the Roman Catholic Church. And they also taught that the sacrament of the Eucharist uh, had no real transubstantiation. In other words, the, the changing of the bread and the wine into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ and then be re-sacrificed all over again on the altar of the Roman Catholic Church was a heresy. So conscientiously, the Madii family taught against Roman Catholicism. Now, other than this, they were upstanding people. They were without uh, accusation. They live pristine lives, as Protestants normally do, normally do, and they were guilty of no other crime but a crime of conscience. Okay, this is a typical example of the persecution of the Roman Catholic Church. They had them arrested and tried and convicted, and because of a recently signed concordat with the Vatican, the state was unable to stop the process, and these innocent people went to jail. Protestant martyrs, simply for reading the Bible and teaching against the Catholic dogmas of transubstantiation and, and purgatory and idol and image worship. We concluded by reading the official indictment last Friday, and all can see that this family, the Madii, have committed no crime whatsoever. Now, James A. Wiley uh, continues reading here. He says, assassination and reading the Bible, Rome ranks in the same category. For no sooner did conviction take place, indeed, the Madii boldly confessed the charge in other words, they admitted, yes, we read the Protestant Bible. Yes, we read other Protestant works. Yes, we teach against transubstantiation and image and idol worship, and there's no such thing as purgatory. Okay. He says, for no sooner did conviction take place, indeed, the Madii boldly confessed the charge, than the sentence usually passed on assassins and similar malefactors was pronounced upon them. Okay. What the Madii family believed and taught is regarded in the Roman Catholic Church as heresy. And heresy, according to Roman Catholic canon law and the repeated teachings of the papacy in succession for over 600 years at the time, was that heresy was answered by death. And in this case, Francis Madii and his wife were sentenced to a life imprisonment. And it says, Francis Madii was condemned to 56 months in Volterra, the Cayenne of Italy, and his wife of 42 months in the Argostolo, the halts for females. So they were imprisoned. And it says, to this punishment were added the costs of process. In other words, the cost of the court case. They had to pay all court costs for their own prosecution. And it says, to this punishment were added the costs of process. Rose Maddie, I heard with, uh, heard with undaunted mind a sentence which the voice of the judge trembled to pronounce. And when it was ended, she erected her feeble frame weakened by long confinement, and turned to her husband, who rose at the same instant, the two smiled sadly to one another and tenderly embraced in the presence of the court. 
an appeal was made to the Court of Cessation, and a petition was at the same time presented to the Grand Duke in behalf of the prisoners. The sentence pronounced by the Court re Regia was confirmed, and the Grand Duke, who had just made a concordat with Rome and had really no power in the matter, returned for answer the two prisoners' petition that was a matter of conscience and that the sentence behooved to be carried out. So they're going to jail for reading the Bible and teaching Protestant teaching and condemning the dogmas of Rome. A matter of conscience. Now it says, in February following of 1853, while the Madii were dragging out their imprisonment in the company of felons, the one in the Argostolo in Lucca and the other in the Casa di Forza amid the poisonous airs of Volterra, the matter was discussed in the British House of Commons. The Honorable Arthur Kincaid introduced the subject in an able speech in which the facts of the case were clearly, concisely, and, con and, uh, uh, and temperately stated and was replied by Messrs. Lucas and Bauer. Even these men found such a case in such a place as the British Senate difficult to handle. The matter was so clear as a case of persecution simply and solely for reading the Bible that their sophistry failed to mystify it and their courage did not enable them to op openly to defend their principle of persecution for conscience sake. <clears throat> so we can take it that Mr. Lucas and Bauer were papists engaged on the uh, uh, the aggressive side of the of the debate against the Madii and even then they couldn't make a convincing case uh, against the Madii and it says uh, he says and so nothing was left them but to fall back on the quote burning of Servetus unquote and the quote persecutions of Elizabeth unquote the papist stock in trade in all cases although a rather disproportionate set off one should think against five centuries of systematic and continuous autos de fe now first of all I want to make sure the listeners understand that the author's writing the only argument that the papists could make in defense of the decision against the Madii, since their innocent their innocence was evident to everyone, even those who were taking the side of the of the of the Pope and the and the government that that convicted the Madii, the only thing that they could serve in the debate as any form of rebuttal was to rehash the case of Servetus, Michael Servetus. Now, Michael Servetus was a Roman Catholic who eventually converted to Protestantism. As a matter of fact, he became part of the Protestant Reformation. And he eventually, because of what uh, Calvin, John Calvin and some other Protestant b believers uh, uh, thought, Servetus came up with teachings that were, well, unconventional. He questioned the Trinity and wrote voluminously about the subject. He was a monotheist, for lack of a better term. He believed that God was one entity. But he fell into conflict with John Calvin, and he was eventually arrested in Geneva and they trumped up the charges until they made it look like he had committed a, 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 uh, a capital offense. And Servetus was burned at the stake by Protestants, by a Protestant, uh, a Protestant men in Protest a Protestant court in Geneva. It's only one example of only a handful of cases of Protestant persecution 
it they are the case of Servetus is an exception to the rule. And so were the persecutions of Queen Elizabeth I of England. It became necessary in order to to preserve the sovereignty of England that certain criminals, papist criminals against the state and against the crown, had to be put to death. But how many times can the papists tell the story of the burning of Servetus and the persecutions of Elizabeth before it becomes monotonous, especially when it's used as a defense of the Roman Catholic Church and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of continuous persecutions against Protestants. And that's the point that James A. Wiley is next to make in the reading of, of this book. He says a single word, first of all, on this point. Granting that all the cases cited by the friends of persecution, that is, by Romanists, are true, and true to all the extent alleged, what of it? Granting that they are a hundred times more numerous than they are, for the recorded cases of Protestant persecution can all be told in a single speech and can all be cited in a single debate, and when used, they are laid aside carefully to be brought forward on the next occasion, granting, we say, that they were a hundred times more numerous than they are, we still ask, what of it? All these crimes are chargeable against the men, not the system. <clears throat> Herein lies the grand point of difference between Protestantism and Romanism. These acts of Protestant persecution were committed by men, some of whom were only pretended Protestants, while others owed the prejudice and intolerance which led them into these errors to that very Romanism which now brings these charges against them. Every Protestant who has persecuted has, to the extent to which he has persecuted, violated the fundamental principle of his system, which recognizes the right of private judgment and Protestantism, so far from sanctioning these acts done in her service, condemns them as a crime committed against her most sacred principles. Protestants may have persecuted. It would have been a miracle, almost, if after ages during which the right of burning men for opinion was held and acted upon as a most sacred duty, they had not fallen into, some, into the crime of their opponents. But whatever Protestants may have done, Protestantism never persecuted. We challenge our opponents to show a single principle included in the knowledge and fundamental doctrines of Protestantism, which either directly or indirectly teaches persecution for conscience' sake. Protestantism never yet shed a single drop of blood or robbed an hour's liberty of a single human being. But how different it is regarding Romanism. Here it is not the men so much as the system that has been per the persecutor. The terminable persecutions which have deluged the world with blood and shed, the sack shed a sackcloth gloom over the, su the successive ages of history are to be laid at the door of the Roman system. The creed of the Church of Rome on, the point, on this point, persecution, is a compendious one. In other words, it would take a library to account for all of the persecutions of the Roman Catholic Church against non-Roman Catholics. He says the punishment of heresy is death. Okay? That is official Roman Catholic canon law. It was determined at the Third and Fourth Lateran Councils. The punishment for heresy, according to the Roman Catholic canon law, is death. And it says, on this dogma, the Crusades were founded. 
on this dogma the Inquisition, with its 14 modes of torture, was built. And to the defense of this terrible dogma, Rome is inevitably committed. Okay, do you understand? He is plainly telling us the dogma that heresy should be answered with death is Rome's permanent doctrine. And persecution, the Roman Catholic Church will be inevitably committed. When Rome ceases to persecute, she ceases to be the Roman Church. That is a baseline definition of the Roman Catholic Church. Persecution of non-Roman Catholics. And as my friend in Christ, uh, Richard Bennett, says, there were 605 years, uninterrupted years, when 83 successive popes, one after the other, built the system of persecution the system of Roman persecution against Protestants. A period of 605 years and 83 consecutive popes built that system. It's a permanent fixture in the Roman Catholic Church. It's one of the identifying characteristics of the Church of Antichrist. Now he says the Quran... <coughs> Excuse me. He says the Quran or the sword was the cry of Muhammad in the East. Believe or burn is the cry of the Muhammad of the seven hills. Okay. Now this, you know, I can't just go buy this and not comment. And I've, I've talked about it many times, even during the reading of this book. We are indoctrinated morning, noon, and night to fear Islam. We're, we're indoctrinated morning, noon, and night about Islamofascism. And that the, the, the Mohammedans, the Islamists, want to rule the world and persecute and kill and annihilate anyone who will not bend the knee to Allah. We're indoctrinated morning, noon, and night that they're building mosques all over this country. And they're imposing Sharia law. And they're even being allowed to do it in many places in Europe. And this persecution is going on. And we're all led to believe that the great fear in the world today is Islam. But when it comes to persecution... Islam must take a seat in, refer in reverence to the Roman Catholic system. No one has persecuted more than Rome. And it is the assertion of Inquisition update through the United States State Department, the CIA, the NSA, the military, the, 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 the governmental system in Washington, D.C. supports... Islamic terror and has literally become the cause of the Islamists fleeing the war-torn areas in the Middle East to seek refuge in Europe for the purpose <clears throat> for the very purpose of bringing Islamic terrorism to Main Street USA and Main Street Europe it's to make the whole world fear and to fight in the streets of their own cities a crusade against Islam. It's Rome's purpose. No one benefits more than the papacy to rise up terror among the Islamist nations and then to to finance it and to <coughs> excuse me to finance it and to arm it through United States taxpayer dollars and then to export it in every nation of the world 
It's Rome who stands to win in the end. You know, in the old days, when the papacy wished to persecute, she, she unloaded all of the prisons and conscripted all the prisoners and all the fighting aged men of Europe into the, to the militaries and then sent them off around the world to, cruci- to, to, to persecute and to kill her enemies. Nowadays, she simply used the United States to terrorize the Middle East and to incite anti-Christian hatred amongst the Islamists and then allow them or demand that they be given refuge within our nations. And it's all in defense of Rome. Now, the the mainstream media will regurgitate until it becomes virtual dogma in this country that the Quran teaches either the Quran or the sword. But the mainstream media of the United States will never mention that the idea of religious persecution was born and bred and exists and multiplies today in the Vatican. Now I repeat what James A. Wiley says. He says the Quran or the sword was the cry of Muhammad in the East. But believe or burn is the cry of the Muhammad of the seven hills. Now remember, James A. Wiley was writing only in 1865, 150 years ago. Has much changed in 150 years? at least regarding religious persecution. The great crusader, the United States of America, is helping the Vatican to to make the world tremble in fear of Muhammad and the Islamists. And then to bring that terror into each and every one of our neighborhoods that we get familiar with it up front and close. And you know violence is going to break out. And the crusade will be fought right in our streets without our knowledge. Anyone who takes up the sword against a Muslim will be part of that crusade, whether he realizes or not, whether he approves or not. We are going to be, we're going to be given an option either to, to, to defend our lives against Islamists or die at the hand of Islamists. And Rome, no matter what the outcome, stands to win in the end. It is the government of the United States that that finances and arms the terrorists. That's being openly discussed now. And it's true. They have brought this terror upon us to force us into a crusade for the papacy. Rome is the instigator of all the world's wars. And she could not do it without the help of the United States government and the United States military. Now many are going to say, Tom, that's not very patriotic of you. Let me, let me make, that cl- make this point clear, too. I'm a citizen of a kingdom of heaven. I have a king and a constitution, and I've been promised a land wherein dwelleth righteousness. And I've loosened my grip on my patriotic spirit for a papist USA. If the United States does not return to Protestantism and begin to renew its protest against the whore of the seven hills and this beast of all beasts in the papal throne in Rome, then the United States is open to God's judgment. And I don't want to be a subject of his judgment. I'm sorry if that sounds anti-patriotic, but I'm patriotic to my king and my kingdom. It's not an earthly king and not an earthly kingdom. We'll be back right after this.
You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book the rapture will be canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to sponsor Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who pays the bills. And uh, another admonition to my listeners, you can full well tell now, uh, as the things that I said before the break, that Inquisition Update is not a very popular program. And so if you are moved by the Holy Spirit to, to support this ministry and uh, give a, uh, a gift to First Amendment Radio to support the program, 
if the Holy Spirit is leading you that way, don't hesitate. Because Inquisition Update doesn't have many listeners. The truths that I talk about here on the Inquisition Update are not popular, either among Catholics or Christians. But it's a truth nonetheless. And there aren't many who are crying this warning. It's a valuable ministry. And I hope and pray God will lead you to support it. Otherwise, Inquisition Update will go off the air and seek other means to uh, spread the truth. <clears throat> but uh, I'm committed for the rest of my life to do this. And whatever mode I can uh, a, a, a gain access to. So, please support First Amendment Radio to keep Inquisition Update on the air. Now, <clears throat> James A. Wiley has, has said, the Quran or the sword was the cry of the Muhammad of the East. Believe or burn is the cry of the Muhammad of the Seven Hills. Clearly, the implication of James A. Wiley is, Rome is the persecutor. And I assert that Rome is the power behind the Islamic terrorism in the world while at the same time, publicly, this Pope Francis is rolling out the red carpet for Islamists. And as a matter of fact, the latest news that I received is that Roman Catholic schools around the world are now setting aside dedicated space within their schools so that Muslims can come to Catholic schools to pray to their God, Allah. So the Vatican publicly is supporting Islam and is promoting Islamic immigration into Europe and the United States and other countries, while its crusader, the United States, is bombing the place and then financing and arming the terrorists at the same time. Difficult as this may sound to people who are indoctrinated by the mainstream media, that's what's really going on in the world. Now he says, to cite cases of oppression committed by Protestants or acts of toleration done by Romanists, it is mere waste of time. These, though true, neither incul inculpate Protestantism nor justify Romanism. We defend not Protestants, but Protestantism. In like manner, we arraign not Romanists, but Romanism. We say that it is essentially a system of persecution, and as such has ever persecuted and ever will persecute, and the difference between it and Protestantism just lies here, that the Protestant violates the fundamental principles of his creed when he persecutes, whereas the Romanist violates the fundamental principle of his creed when he tolerates. And as is the creed, so is the practice of that church, wherever she has the power. Death stands as the unrepealed penalty in the canon law against heresy. And death, of, uh, and death, the Church of Rome, is in our day inflicting on those whom she calls heretics. Okay? Remember, this is 1865. James A., just 150 years ago, James A. Wiley says, Death is demanded by Roman Catholic canon law against heretics, and that death imposed by Roman Catholic canon law is being inflicted upon Protestants to this very day, 1865. Again, I ask, has Rome changed in 150 years? <clears throat> Not one iota. As a matter of fact, Rome is killing to a greater extent today, possibly, than she ever has in the history of the world. 
and she's doing it through the United States military and other papist nations around the world. And you've heard me talk in the past about how the Vatican fomented World War I and for what purpose, and also World War II and for what purpose. You've heard me suggest over and over and over again that the old modes of persecution used by the Roman Catholic Church in the Dark Ages, the inquisitional courts that went from town to town and rounded up all the heretics, <coughs> convicted them, and sentenced them to torture and punishment and burning at the stake, well, that's all been rendered obsolete. Now Rome must kill on a biblical scale. And the only way Rome can commit the kind of persecution that canon law demands on a global scale is through world wars. And World War I and World War II and the current war on terror are simply Rome's new mode of persecution. And no one is more handy at shedding the blood of, 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 of heretics than the United States government. And the British government, for that matter. And isn't it ironic that the Vatican uses mostly Protestant nations to bring that persecution upon others in the world. That is a reality that just is almost incomprehensible. That Protestant countries have now become the right hand, the right arm of the Holy Roman Inquisition. It's, it's, it's a reality that is, that boggles the mind and shakes the spirit. Okay, it says, <clears throat> And death the church of Rome is in our day inflicting on those whom she calls heretics. Does the Romanist ask where? We reply, in Italy and in Spain. Quote, The Grand Duke of Tuscany still hesitates on the subject of the Madii, observed Lord John Russell, but, he justly added, this is a matter on which hesitation implies capital punishment, unquote. Yes, Rome has not changed the punishment. She has only slightly changed the mode of inflicting it. The sharp dispatch of the torture, or the still sharper dispatch of the state, she can no longer employ. These are old-fashioned methods of killing, which that church has learned to do without. She has invented slower processes, which have the twofold recommendation of, the pro of prolonging the agonies of the victim and screening from public odium the infamy of the persecutor. The flames that licked up the limbs of Savonarola in the square of Florence were merciful, compared to those of heavy-laden sufferings which a delicate woman has been compelled to endure in our own times in the Borgello of that same city. In the one case, the spirit is not killed, but it nobly triumphs over the sufferings of the body. It can look undauntedly upon its doom. It knows the worst. It sees before it one-half hours of one-half hours thrilling agony and then the triumph of the palm forever. But it requires yet greater courage firmly to contemplate and unshrinkingly to endure the slow, corroding, ever-recurring, and never-ending misery of a solitary imprisonment for life, or what is equivalent thereto. To walk through an avenue of horrors to the grave, who can tell what suffering is in that? There is the silence that grows from day to day and from hour to hour till it becomes at last terrible and insupportable, insupportable, excuse me. Sad and strange thoughts, which the mind has no power to banish, begin to intrude themselves. The felon's dress and the felon's chain perpetually suggest the idea of a felon's character 
Okay, can you see the mental torture of being one of the Madii, God-fearing, law-abiding citizens, guilty of nothing else but preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, now being dressed in the garb of a felon? and laden with the chains of a felon, and put in a prison like a felon alongside a whole prison full of felons. What does that say after months and months and years and years of imprisonment? What does that do to one's psyche? What does that do to one's spirit? And how long can one suffer this torture without going insane? He says health gives way <clears throat> and spirits sink. A fearful gloom begins to encompass the soul. The world of the living is gone. It has cast the sufferer out, yet the other has not opened its gates as a shelter from his sorrows. He inhabits a void beyond the confines of earth. Reason begins to totter. First comes imbecility, then idiocy, and then death. Ah, it were easy to pass at once to the scaffold, but to walk to one's grave through a crowd of terrors, each more awful than the scaffold, who can tell the agony that there is in a doom like this? It was this fearful doom which Rome publicly inflicted, for we must hold the intention equivalent to the deed in the middle of the 19th century upon the Madii for the crime of reading the scriptures. For the crime of reading the scriptures. And it needs to be reminded to my Protestant listeners that for reading the scriptures, the saints of God throughout history have been destroyed by the Roman Catholic Church. And if you are compelled to believe the malarkey coming from the mainstream media, that it is only Islamists that we have to fear. You have been deceived, and the Bible has not been your source for truth, and history has been ignored. It is that biblical truth and historical truth that Inquisition Update seeks to bring on a daily basis here at First Amendment Radio. And I was wish to continue to do it as long as God gives me breath. Now, the next part, the fourth part of this book is entitled Maynooth, Convents, and, Apl and Compliances. And it begins thus. Maynooth, re remember, being a city and a, a college in uh, Roman Catholic Ireland, which was a Jesuit stronghold during the Protestant reign of the kings and queens of England, and it was Ireland that continually brought popery to the mainland, the main island, England, and eventually helped to overthrow the government or attempt to overthrow the government for a papal government during this, this papal aggression that happened in the 1860s. He says, Maynooth is the central and in some respects the most formidable part of the papal organization in Great Britain. It is so on several grounds. It is a fountainhead of popery and a fountainhead kept open by a Protestant state. Its professors are salaried and its students are lodged, fed, and clothed, and educated for some seven or eight years at the nation's expense. Okay, now this is a reference to Roman Catholic canon law, which insists that the state should support and sanction the Roman Catholic faith. It should pay its priests, it should build its churches, it should educate its children in Romanism, it should be the government of the land, 
this is state-sponsored religion. It is required in Roman Catholic canon law. State-sponsored Roman Catholicism is canon law. And this is what Purpose Maynooth and Roman Catholic Ireland provided the papacy. Okay, Maynooth is the fountainhead of popery, the fountainhead kept open by a Protestant state. Okay, Protestant England was financing Maynooth, was financing the Roman Catholic state in Ireland. And the Roman Catholic state in Ireland was dedicated to overthrowing the Protestant government of England and replacing it with, the, with papal rule. Now, do you understand the insanity that has now taken over the Protestant nations? It's not new. Rome can virtually count on it. The Protestants have forgotten who the Antichrist is. Now, we have a Protestant nation who is now financing and arming and occupying the military forces put in place to, to persecute the, the Islamists and fight this, this Roman crusade against Islam in the Middle East. It is a Protestant nation that is financing this crusade, this papal crusade. Now, if you find it hard to believe that Protestant England would finance its Roman Catholic assassins in Ireland, look at what the United States is doing today. We must recognize our error. We must return to Protestantism. That was the call of James A. Wiley during the time of the writing of this book. That is the call of Inquisition update today. We must return to Protestantism. No longer shall a Protestant state finance a Roman Catholic overthrow of all the governments of the world, pay for it with their tax dollars, pay for it with their blood and their guts and the future of their children, only to be destroyed by a Roman global government. We've got to come to our senses. We've got to come to our Protestant, prophetic, biblical, and historical senses in this country. Maynooth was a fountainhead of popery and a fountainhead kept open by a Protestant state. Its professors are salaried and its students are lodged, fed, clothed, and educated for some seven or eight years at the nation's expense, at Protestant England's expense, at the yearly cost of 30,000 <coughs> pounds. If I could just get rid of the frog in my throat, I would continue. It says, at the yearly cost of 30,000 pounds, we provide, we Protestants of England provide Roman Catholic priests for teaching all over Protestant Great Britain and her colonies. That very popery which as Protestants we testify against as idolatry. Now, I, I, I don't want you to miss what is very easy to miss in what he just said. He says, at the yearly cost of 30,000 pounds, we provide Roman Catholic priests for teaching all over Great Britain and her colonies. Thirty thousand pounds to pay Roman Catholic priests to teach Romanism all over Protestant Great Britain and her colonies that very popery which as Protestants we testify is idolatry. Do you see the insanity? The taxpayers of England were working, struggling very hard to pay their taxes 
And what was their Protestant government doing with it? Financing the growth of popery, financing the growth of idolatry, financing the growth of blasphemy, financing the growth of popery all over Great Britain and the colonies. And what are we doing today? You know, if somebody asserted that the tax money of this country was being collected by the government and used to buy Protestant Bibles to ship all over to China and India and Russia and South and Central America and Rome, the country would be livid. We're not paying taxes for King James Bibles to go anywhere but to the, to the flames. That's what this country would demand. An immediate halt to taxpayer, taxpayer dollars being used to promote Protestantism around the world. But you don't hear one word of protest that our entire military system, State Department, CIA, NSA, the whole government structure of Washington, D.C., not to even mention the, nine, the, 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 the overwhelming majority of Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court are, are Roman Catholic, designed to spread popery all over the world at your expense. Do you think you might protest? even a little bit. A yearly cost of 30,000 pounds, we Protestant Englanders provide Roman Catholic priests for teaching all over Great Britain and her colonies that very popery, which as Protestants we testify against as idolatry. He says, but further, so long as Maynooth remains on its present footing, the endowment of the Church of Rome in Great Britain hangs over our heads. The same logic by which we justify ourselves for educating the priests of Rome would seem to demand that we should pay these men when engaged in educating others. The endowment of Maynooth is valued by the priesthood on this, among other grounds, that it is a promise of something better. In the document issued by the Defense Association, we find the priests asserting that, quote, the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland, unquote, accepted the endowment of that seminary, quote, as a small installment of justice from a legislature which has robbed her of millions, unquote. You see, even when Rome took it upon, or when, when England took it upon itself to use its taxpayer dollars to endow the Roman Catholic Church at Maynooth and all over our, uh, England, the Roman Catholic Church answered, well, it's, you owe it to us. We don't consider it a gift. We consider it just a small endowment, uh, just a small a small installment of the justice for the loss of Roman Catholicism in England when it became Protestant under Henry VIII. Rome is never satisfied. You can endow her churches, you can endow her priests, but you have not tolerated her you have not supported her, you have not given her equality till you raise her up to the King of kings and Lord of lords in your land and made every subject of your land a subject of the Pope of the Pontiff. It's global conquest or nothing. And what would you expect of a man who calls himself the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. A man, a filthy, sin-sick man who says, when the Pope speaks, it is God who speaks. 
What could you expect but a global government being demanded by that man? And that's what we have in the world. Easily recognizable in the world, and yet no one condemns. And it's, it's Protestantism that appears to be intolerant. It's Protestantism that is made to, to appear intolerant in the world today. Just a small installment of justice from a legislature which had robbed the Roman Catholic Church of millions. That's the thanks they got from the endowment of the Roman Catholic priests. They wanted more, much more. How much do you think they want in the United States of America? Well, they control the powerhouse in Washington, D.C. They control the Supreme Court. They control the seminaries. The Federal Reserve Bank is a Jesuit bank. How much do you think they will take before they're finally satiated? Do you think they'll be left anything for God's people? Bible-believing people? Those who preach and teach the Bible? And have committed no other crime? Just like the Madii? I hope I've made my point. We'll continue with the reading and discussion of the book Rome and Civil Liberty by James A. Wiley on the broadcast tomorrow. Thanks for listening. I'll see you then.